Imagine you've just been married. It's autumn, let's say October 23rd, and the year is 1918. You're psyched because despite the war that's been raging for the last four years, taking the lives of some of the ones that you love and a bunch of stuff like that, you get to be happy today because today you are marrying the love of your life. You're standing for the altar at your local church and for the first time in four years, you feel like you can breathe. That breath, however, will be one of your last. You'd heard the stories of people dying from a virus, but the paper said it had in England, or if it had, it wasn't hard and common. So that crowd at your wedding, though, it carried more than good wishes. Inside that crowd lingered something sinister, and that something would enter your lungs and it would take hold of you. That evil would take your life just seven days after your wedding, and to your local church, you would return. But this time, it'll be for your funeral. When death comes for you, it doesn't care how happy you are, it doesn't discriminate from the young and the old, and it certainly doesn't care if you feel like you finally have just started your life. The evil we speak of has a name. A name we all have heard, but maybe know little about. Creeps, it's time we talk about the Spanish influenza. I had a little bird, and its name was Enza. I opened the window and influenza. The story of Catherine Wade Dalton is just one of 50 million tragic tales the flu pandemic of 1918 created. You heard that right. 50 million tales. 50 million people dead from a single virus. That is more than the bubonic plague. That is more than typhoid. Hell, it's almost as much as all the deaths in World War II. So you have to ask yourself, why are not more people talking about this? Where are all the museums commemorating all the lives lost? I've been to the quarantine station in Manly, Australia, where hundreds died and thousands were treated. I've seen the many headstones of families inscribed with a death date from 1918 or 1919. But where are the memorials? Where are the long lessons in school about this pandemic that shook the world and took almost 5% people, 5% of the world's population, and was the cause of a third of the 18 million men whom died in World War I? This weekend marks the 100 year anniversary of the Spanish influenza. And so I feel it is my duty to present you all, to the best of my capabilities, the facts you probably hadn't heard about history's most deadly disease. And since I'm in LA, Let's talk about how Los Angeles managed to save more citizens than almost any other large American city. But first, I need some wine. So I'm drinking the 2013 Pinot Noir from C'est La Vie from the Europa Vineyards in Temecula. I freaking love it. It's sexy, it's sinful, and it won't give you the flu. So bonus points for that. So let's start with some facts, shall we? What the hell is the Spanish influenza? Why do we call it that? Where did it come from? And how long did it last? Okay, basically it's just the flu. Technically it's H1N1 with avian origin. It's called the Spanish influenza because 1918, when the little bugger showed up, was at the tail end of World War I. It was important, morale wasn't lost, obviously. So when this pesky little popped up with a pension for killing in the military camps, the military in each participating country didn't want others catching wind of it and thinking they had an advantage. So newspapers were censored in the UK, Germany, the US, and France to limit how bad the virus was and how bad it was spreading. Spain, however, was neutral, and so the newspapers were free to report about how thousands were dying from it. This led people to believe Spain was the hardest hit when in reality, <laughs> It definitely wasn't. It was like they were all getting hit. No one knows exactly where it came from. That's just the facts, folks. Sorry. There's reports of it starting in Kansas, of all places, in a military encampment in France, and some blamed it on the Chinese laborers who were sent to France. All we know is that it was airborne, it was germy, and you could catch it super, super easily. The pandemic lasted primarily from January 1918 to December of 1919, with a few cases as early as 1917 and as late as December of 1920. The pandemic is broken into three sections, which people call waves, and the second wave, which hit America in September of 1918, would prove to be the worst and most deadly. So let's just start talking about some death, shall we? 
When you think of the flu or pneumonia, you first think about how awful it is. And then that thought is usually followed up by a sense of relief that if you're young-ish, say 20s to 40s, you probably won't be dying if you catch it. <laughs> Hilarious. Or so this particular pandemic thought because you were actually its target age. How cute. Sure, the disease took children and the elderly, but oddly and unique to this pandemic, it took many the lives of young and healthy, much like happened from the beginning. There are a couple theories as to why this is. Some believe that when a young person with a healthy immune system was infected, that healthy immune system, that would usually save them, obviously, ended up overreacting, creating way too many white blood cells in a reaction called a cytokine storm, which would basically end in a rapid respiratory failure. That sucks. The other theory is less of a theory and more of a fact. 20 to 40 year olds were the largest number of people fighting in the war, working in the hospitals, working in the general workforce, going to the theater and dance halls, hell, even going to freaking school. And given that hygiene wasn't great and a lot of our soldiers were malnourished, the civilians at times not doing much better, and the hospitals were crazy overcrowded, one starts to think it had more to do with exposure than terrorist white blood cells. But hey, I'm neither a specialist or a doctor. But exposure is exactly where LA ended up excelling when the pandemic hit its shores. The first documented civilian case in Los Angeles was September 22nd. However, it wasn't publicly reported until the 27th. I should also mention that the first civilian case was actually 55 students from the Polytechnic High School downtown. But hey, <laughs> who's counting? Also, when they reported it, they claimed it was alleged influenza. Convenient. Then September 28th happens, a naval reserve ship pulls up to the harbor, turns out they lost a couple seamen to the virus on the sea, and we're now put in precautionary quarantine. Right. Next, the Arcadia Balloon School, which if you don't know what that is, it's basically hot air balloons that the army used for stuff like spying. Weird, whatever. Anyways, was quarantined so people couldn't go to Pasadena. The upshot, the Spanish lady had come to LA. Sensing the coming storm, the respected and longtime beloved health commissioner Milton Powers advised Mayor Woodman to prepare the city for shutdown, basically. Mayor Woodman wasn't an idiot, and so he brought 11 of the city's best physicians together along with Powers to form an advisory board. October 10th, they held a meeting that was attended by like every big wig city guy from the Inland Empire to the Valleys to Orange County and basically laid down the facts for them. The virus is here. <laughs> we have no way of curing it. Shut your stuff down because people are gonna die and we want to like have less death. The following day, October 11th, Mayor Woodman declared a state of emergency and gave powers the authority to make some hardcore decisiones. By 6 p.m. that day, the city was essentially shut down. I mean, seriously shut down. Schools, theaters, dance halls, dentist offices, churches, work. Funerals, all of it, you were now banned to go outside. If you were caught going out or attending one of the banned places, <laughs> you may be fined $25 and face up to 30 days in jail, which is hilarious to me because if you did go out, you'd probably get infected and you'd probably die, which seems punishment enough to me, but no one asked me. A funny little thing that LA had to add to its list of bans that other cities didn't have to worry about was the explicit ban of no filming mob scenes because those tended to draw crowds. And you know what's in crowds? Death. A humongous decision Powers made was to cancel the Liberty Day Parade that was supposed to kick off the fourth Liberty Loan celebration. Even though other cities had instituted similar ban laws, many cities decided to not cancel their parades. Nothing gets in the way of the money, right? Well, in many cities, like the one held in Philadelphia, many came away from the parade with a death sentence. 72 people died the day following the parade in Philly, and that number rose each day after. So in many ways, Powers made a decision that saved the lives of thousands of Angelinos. The advisory board and Powers met weekly, and they released daily stats on how many newly affected cases there were and how many new deaths. This gave the public confirmation that being home quarantined was for a good reason and led to less pushback. Hospitals were filling up fast though, like super fast, and doctors and nurses were in short supply. 
So Powers ordered two additional temporary hospitals be set up. And when he realized the poor didn't have anywhere to go or cover after they were discharged from the hospital, he asked for funding and turned hotels into convalescent homes for them. He was kind of rad. But there was still a problem. This thing wasn't stopping and they had no real way to cure or prevent it outside of limiting chances of contagion. Some cities mandated the use of gauze face masks. Both Powers and Mayor Woodman thought it was a good idea, but the city council wasn't buying it and instead issued a statement saying that it was voluntary. Powers was always looking for ways to try and fix the situation though. So on Halloween of 1919, he released a statement saying all tenants were now required to wash their sidewalks and doorways each day and that areas of the city were to be disinfected. With what and how, I have no idea. Examples of odd precautionary measures and treatments littered the world during the pandemic. During my visit to the quarantine in Manly, I saw machines that disinfected luggage, a room that resembled gas chambers that released steam to try and clean out people's lungs, and old school versions of portable respirators. Back in the States, we were just fighting about how much aspirin to prescribe to the infected and if they should wear face masks or not. Things didn't stay so nice and cordial in the city though. When newly reported cases dropped from 500 a day to 350, Powers jumped the gun and publicly said he believed the virus had peaked. This gave people hope which made them anxious to get back to normal life. One of the most anxious was the Christian Science Church that tried to say it was unconstitutional to be forced to close, demanded to be reopened. When they were denied, they opened anyways and were arrested. Then you had the movie theater owners and the film producers whom believed they were being singled out and targeted by being forced to remain closed when other businesses remained opened. They demanded every business that wasn't necessary be closed like them. Powers, the city council, and the advisory board all had different views on the situations and this created rifts. Things got worse when the number of newly infected cases started to rise again. Despite the growing number of deaths, people were getting anxious to be freed from their confines. Going against the wishes of Powers, the city council released a statement that said they would shut the city down for five days and then reopen where people could go out voluntarily. This obviously ended with lots more death. Powers finally relented though, and on December 2nd, the city was reopened. The high of the public though was short-lived because students started contracting the disease and the child death toll rose. Working with Superintendent Shields, Powers devised a monitoring system to record infection rates within the school system to determine which areas could be reopened and considered flu free. Coupled with exams of every student and teacher before being allowed to return to school, the death rates dropped exponentially and by February 6th, all the schools were open. At the end of the day, 494 people to every 100,000 died in Los Angeles. This was lower than every other city in the US by a few hundred. That's no joke. This absolutely wouldn't have been the case if the city hadn't acted as quickly as they did. That's just the truth. Cities like Philadelphia suffered much worse. They even experienced a coffin shortage. People literally couldn't make coffins fast enough to keep up demand. Bodies were stacked in morgues and eventually dumped into mass graves. Mass graves of flu victims covered this globe, but you'll be hard pressed to find out where. In fact, in my own search to find out where the ones in LA were located, I came up with nothing. Naturally, this pisses me off. Let's get one thing straight. People didn't just contract this disease and die easily. No. A woman named Gina Colada described it. She said, your face turns a dark brownish purple. You start to cough up blood. Your feet turn black. Finally, as the end nears, you frantically grasp for breath. A blood tinged saliva bubbles out of your mouth. You die by drowning actually, as your lungs fill with the reddish fluid. 50 million people experienced a version of that death and there is nowhere to go that memorializes that. More importantly, why the hell is this not more widely known? I'll tell you why, fear. Unlike other diseases that have killed populations that we now have cures and remedies for, we still cannot cure the flu. Our best defense is a flu shot, which could actually give you the flu. Maybe scariest of all, this was only a hundred years ago, creeps. This is not a medieval plague that killed kings and queens. This is for most 
only three generations ago. That strain might have been aggressive. Researchers postulate that when the pandemic finally ended, it was probably because it had mutated, the deadliest of it dying out as all viruses end up doing. But remember, annually, 3,000 to 49,000 people die from this still globally. Just like a rat carrying the bubonic plague today, that deadly string of flu is out there and maybe that's why we're not talking about it. We don't want to face a demon from the past that could become a demon of the present. Time for more wine? I think so. I hope you enjoyed our little lesson today, creeps. Don't forget to wash your hands, cover your mouth when you cough, and only kiss the strangers you think are worth dying for. Chin chin, creeps. <laughs>